Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Joanna Lewis. I'm the director of the Science, Technology, and International Affairs program here in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Over the past century, innovation in science and technology has dramatically transformed modern society. The accelerating pace of technological and scientific discoveries has created new challenges and opportunities related to environmental sustainability, cybersecurity, global health, and modern warfare. More than ever, leaders in government and the private sector must be able to understand fundamental concepts in science and technology to fully grasp the complexity of today's global policy problems. Drawing on Georgetown's expertise across international affairs, public policy, global health, environmental studies, and security studies, the School of Foreign Service established the Science, Technology, and International Affairs program, STIA, in 1982 to educate the next generation of leaders skilled in science and technology, create knowledge that will advance cross-cutting solutions for today's most pressing issues, and drive innovation at the nexus of science and international affairs. STIA aims to develop and transmit critical knowledge needed to meet the challenges of a global future in which economic development, improved human health, international security, and environmental sustainability are achieved equitably. STIA's educational and research missions focus on the interactions of science, technology, society, international affairs within the areas of business growth and development, technology and security, global health and biotechnology, and energy and the environment. And STIA approaches its mission through the integration of multiple academic perspectives, drawing from theory and practice of the natural and social sciences and linking them to policy and practice as a resource for the next generation of ethically and socially conscious leaders in science, business, government, medicine, and civil society. And many of them are in this room. In 1999, Paul and Catherine Malloy endowed the Malloy Family Fund to support health-related projects and an annual distinguished, distinguished lecture in global health here in the STIA program. Paul J. Malloy graduated from the School of Foreign Service, and Catherine Fowler Malloy was a graduate of the former nursing, School of Nursing and Health Studies. We have been holding the Malloy Distinguished Lecture in Global Health on campus each spring to highlight a leader and innovator in the global health field. And I cannot think of anyone who represents leadership in global health at this time in history more than our speaker this evening. We are grateful for the support of the Malloy family and their extensive service to Georgetown and delighted that Christine Malloy Jacobs, SFS class of 92, is able to join us for this evening's event. And on behalf of the STIA program, thank you to everyone who made this event possible. I would now like to turn it over to Dean Joel Hellman, a Dean of the School of Foreign Service, to introduce this evening's speaker. It's great to be here. Thank you so much, Joanna, for your leadership in running the STIA program and helping it to be one of the most dynamic majors here at Georgetown. I also want to thank Emily Mendenhall, who's here, will be leading the dialogue for her many contributions through her incredible research and her teaching on public health issues and her role in bringing Dr. Fauci to this distinguished Malloy lecture series. And to that end, of course, let me recognize the Malloy family. It's great to have you here, and thank you so much for your support um, in this, not only in this, but in, uh, in many other ways. You know, SFS is a school built, as Joanna said, to train new generations, to understand global problems, and to combine the best of theory and practice to craft durable solutions to those problems. Who better represents that guiding mission than Dr. Anthony Fauci? For over 40 years, he has been at the intersection of research and problem solving to confront some of the most challenging global crises of our time. His own personal contribution to research would be deserving on its own of the greatest accolades. He was involved in recognizing HIV in 1981. He made seminal contributions to research during the early days of the AIDS pandemic. He spent his life conducting studies and developing therapies and preventive tools um, for the global virus. He's the author, co-author, editor of more than 1,400 scientific publications over the course of his career. But of course, Dr. Fauci is so much more than a researcher. He is a man of action on a scale that few globally can match. He led the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease for nearly four decades 
shepherding work on autoimmune diseases as well as infectious diseases. He's advised seven U.S. presidents. He was one of the primary architects of PEPFAR, a program that has saved more than 20 million lives around the world and remains one of the most celebrated models of how to have impact on a global scale. And of course, he's become perhaps one of the most recognizable public figures in the world with 58 honorary degrees from universities around the world, advocating for how to bolster medical and public health preparedness to deal with the remaining risks of emerging infectious diseases. Dr. Fauci is the very embodiment of Georgetown's mission. And for that reason, we are so very honored to have Dr. Fauci here to speak in our most distinguished lecture series. Dr. Fauci. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It's really a, a great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to talk about a subject, as you could see on this first slide, of obvious relevance and importance to what we've been through over the last three now going into four years. So I decided what I would do is rather than tell you a lot of things you already know about which each and every one of us have experienced, is to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we hopefully have learned from this horrible experience we've gone through and how that would inform us as we go forward to what the next inevitable challenge which will be, and that will be another pandemic sometime very likely in the lives of many people in this room. So first of all, uh, just a little bit background to set the stage for the lessons to refresh your memory uh, is that in January of 2020, some unusual pneumonias were noted in the city of Wuhan in central China associated with the Wuhan seafood market in Wuhan. The Chinese identified this as a coronavirus on January 9th of 2020. And the next day, the sequence with the help of Eddie Holmes, who's an Australian investigator, and Professor Zhang from the Wuhan put together the genomic sequence on a public database, which was very, very rapid. Uh, this I know for those of you not uh, familiar with phylogenetic viruses, this is really a phylogenetic tree which shows, as you can see in the green, is there any way we could shut the, the lights off so uh, that go on that screen? Is there any? possibility of doing that? Because, yeah, because I mean, I can't even see it myself. Uh, <laughs> um, as you can see, the, the human coronaviruses are uh, in red. And in the part that says beta coronaviruses, there are a number of viruses. And one of them, as you can see, is SARS-CoV-2 clustered right in there with a number of bat coronaviruses, as well as what we experienced about you know, over 20 years ago with SARS-CoV-1, which was in 2002, and then MERS in 2012. Now, the first travel-related case of SARS-CoV-2, some of you may remember, occurred on January 20th and was reported on January 21 of 2020. Fast forward just a couple of months and the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic, which at that time had more than 100,000 cases in over 100 countries and close to 4,500 deaths already. For those of you who were paying attention at that time, we thought it was already bad at that point, but little did we know what was to be experienced in the coming couple of years. So now let's fast forward a full three years from that last slide that I showed you. Now with the unprecedented situation of over 760 million cases and close to 7 million deaths. 
that's recognized deaths. There are some estimates that the actual global death total is perhaps two and perhaps threefold higher than that. In the United States, where we have a better capability of assessing burden of disease, there have been over 100 million cases and at least 1.1 million reported deaths. That's the background. So let's talk now about what I've picked out 10 lessons. I mean, if you want to get granular about it, there's probably 25 lessons that we can learn. But I want to pick out just those that I think would be not only relevant, but perhaps of particular interest to this audience. So let's go through them. First, expect the unexpected. And that is something that has really been a theme that has followed me throughout, as you heard from Joel, my, my now more than 50-year career and close to 40 years as the director of NIAID. There are certain subgroups of that expect the unexpected. One of the things that truly was unprecedented was the extraordinary degree of the evolution of variants as opposed to one big outbreak that you usually expect as you'll see in a moment, we had multiple waves of variants. Now, this is a slide that, please don't, don't, don't phase out on me on this slide, okay? Um, this is a phylogenetic family tree, but what I want to point out, if you look at the left-hand part of the slide, when the first, what we call ancestral strain hit us, that was WA1, there were variants that came off, alpha, beta, delta, gamma. And then what happened about a year and a half to two years ago was a variant that was so far different. And that's the reason why you see that line extended way out, that Omicron was very, very different from the others. So the cross reactivity and protection that you might get from an infection with an alpha that might protect you against at least severe disease from a delta or a gamma, you really didn't see that very much when you went way out to the Omicron. And all these little squigglies in the lower right are what we call sublineages of, of Omicron. So we've been living through sublineages of Omicron which escape protection against infection, but not necessarily protection against severe disease because of the overlapping cross-reactivity within the cluster of sublineages of Omicron. However, the good news is that you get cross-reactivity. The sobering news as you go from the lower left to up to the upper right, and each step on that staircase is the evolution of another variant which was characterized by increased growth capacity and increased transmissibility. So there's a somewhat inherently contradictory situation, whereas you had more transmissibility for any of a number of reasons, either inherent to the virus or because of the underlying community protection that you have when you get enough people who are either infected and or vaccinated. That has led to the multiple spikes. And this is what we've really experienced when you look at this slide. When you start off with the infections early on in February and March of 2020, a spike with alpha, then another spike with delta. And as I alluded to just a moment ago, take a look at the sharpness of the spike in cases with Omicron which as you look at where we are right now in the far right-hand part of the slide, the number of cases, relatively speaking, is much, much lower. So we are in a much better place. When you look at deaths, they tend, in fact, to reflect, obviously, cases reflect hospitalizations, hospitalizations reflect death. The bottom line message is that we were completely unprepared historically, to have continual waves of viruses of the same broad species that continue to evade immunity. 
That leads to what do you do about that? And obviously, we now have updated boosters, but we really can't be playing whack-a-mole for every new variant because we will continue to have new variants. Right now, the predominant variant in our society is XBB.1.5, about 91% of the isolates are that. It's not going to stay that way. I'll guarantee you as we get into the summer and the fall, it'll evolve into another one. The thing that worries us all and why we always have to keep looking over our shoulder is just shown in this other cartoon. It's nice that the pandemic is behind us so we can all get together again and then out of nowhere might come a brand new variant. Do I think that's going to happen? You know, you never make a prediction. I've, we've given up about predictions when it comes to SARS-CoV-2. But I would think this would be a bit unlikely to have a completely different variant. However, it is certainly possible. The next part of expecting the unexpected is something, again, that we used influenza as a model. And this is not like influenza. Because if you look at asymptomatic and presymptomatic transmission, in an unprecedented way, almost 60% of all the transmissions are from someone who has no symptoms, either doesn't have and never will have symptoms, or is in the presymptomatic stage. That means all bets are off about the syndromic approach makes it very difficult to do contact tracing, makes it very important when we tell people to wear masks. The original thought was, well, you know, if somebody's symptomatic, I'll stay away from them. Or if I'm without symptoms, I don't have to worry about transmitting it to somebody else. No, that does not hold when you're dealing with SARS-CoV-2. And the next is something, again, that we only appreciated a few months into this, is that aerosol transmission predominates. If you look at the slide, the thought of droplet transmission, someone who's symptomatic, they're coughing, you can actually see the bit of a spray, those droplets tend to fall down. Aerosol means it just stays in the air anywhere from hours or longer, merely by breathing, not necessarily by coughing, but by breathing or speaking, that's what aerosol means. And that was the reason why there was a concern. And we used to see outbreaks in choirs among individuals who were otherwise well. Nobody was sick. They were just there doing their thing, singing, infecting each other. That's another lesson that we learned. Lesson number two, you have to act early and rapidly with public health interventions. When you're dealing with a pandemic, what you're experiencing today was caused by something that happened two to three weeks ago. And what's going on now is gonna manifest itself three weeks from now when you're talking about the spread of a virus. So look at this most extraordinary, I don't know if you could see it, these things are in the way. <laughs> the, uh, the <laughs> Well, whatever. Um, <laughs> you can see how it just percolated along very, very low level and then just took off in an exponential way. So pandemics are not linear. They're exponential. That's an important lesson you have to learn. So when you see it going up like that, don't feel comfort because if it's an epidemic and a pandemic, it's going to do this, and that's exactly what happened, which is the reason why, and this I think is important when you talk about people who are interested in foreign service and international things, the G7 in their discussion has made it very clear that they want all the countries to be able to have an aspirational goal of what we call the 100-day mission, so that within the first 100 days that a pandemic threat is identified, intervention should start to become available. And I'm going to get into that in some of the other lessons that we'll talk about. Lesson three, global information sharing and collaborations are essential. And that's everything from samples like reagents 
infected and convalescent patient samples, genomic data, real-world clinical data, viral isolates. Now, some of you are following this pretty closely in a granular way. You may be hearing most recently about viral sequences that were isolated a year or two ago from the Wuhan market that have never until most recently accidentally found that they actually have viral isolates mixed up with animal um, DNA, animals that should never have been in the market. So what is actually unfolding now, and you'll hear more about it in the weeks to come, is a violation of lesson number three, that global information sharing and collaborations are essential. We can get into that in the question period because that's a very hot topic. Now, some of the examples of that is that we have, for example, GSAD, we have Med uh, uh, Archive, which is preprints, which have some disadvantage, but I think more advantage than disadvantage, as well as a number of, of mostly funded at the NIH and other institutions of sharing of reagents. Lesson number four, you have to essentially leverage clinical trial infrastructure. We did this in a very successful way, taking the infrastructure that we built over 40 years to do clinical trials with HIV, namely the HIV Vaccine Trial Network, the HPTN, the ACTG, all of the networks that we did clinical trials with HIV, we leveraged them and overnight converted them to what we call the COVID-19 Prevention Network, or COVPN. And in fact, these are networks that I, when I was the director of NIAID, I established beginning in the mid-1980s associated with HIV. Some of you may not be aware, but all of these global sites were involved in the vaccine trial that showed in an 11-month time frame that the COVID-19 vaccines were safe and effective. If we didn't have that infrastructure that we utilized, that we built 40 years ago, we never would have been able to do this as rapidly and as efficiently as we did. Lesson number five. This, to me, as a scientist, is, I think, the most compelling lesson that we should not forget, is that prior scientific advances enabled us to have rapid countermeasure development and very likely resulted in the saving globally of millions of lives. And I described this a couple of years ago in a commentary in Science in which I said the speed and efficiency with which these highly efficacious vaccines were developed and their potential for saving millions of lives was due to an extraordinary multidisciplinary effort involving basic preclinical and clinical science that was underway, under the radar screen, out of the spotlight for decades before unfolding of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, let me explain this in a way that I, I, I hope will be uh, easy and understandable. When you look at vaccine development, there are two major components, the vaccine platform and the vaccine immunogen. The platform is merely how you, what's the vehicle for delivering the vaccine? Either killed, live attenuated, recombinant DNA, viral vector, that's the platform. The immunogen is the business end of the vaccine. Are you dealing with polio? Are you dealing with measles? Are you dealing with the spike protein of MERS or SARS? Now, the scientific effort that was put into both of these antedated COVID by decades, something that people don't fully understand. So, for example, the COVID vaccine platform, not the only one, but the one that has gained most attention, is the mRNA technology. That did not appear overnight. 
What happened is that a number of investigators, Drew Weissman and Katie Carrico particularly, were working for literally a couple of decades in showing that mRNA, which most people thought you couldn't use for a vaccine because mRNA is what many viruses are made of, RNA. When you stick it in the body, the body misinterprets it as the invasion of a virus, develops an inflammatory response, and gets rid of your vaccine before you even have it work. They did, over years, the modification of the molecule that actually now allows that mRNA to serve as the signal to produce the protein without inducing an inflammatory reaction. That will almost certainly win Drew and Katie a Nobel Prize. I would be really surprised. Look at the date on that paper when they first did it, 2005. So vaccine research for COVID did not begin in 1919 or 2020. The next is the imaging design. This is a really wonderful story. So I'm going to take an extra minute to tell it, tell it to you. And that is it relates to the structure-based immunogen design that was done unsuccessfully for HIV for decades. What do I mean by that? The Vaccine Research Center at the NIH, which we established more than 20 years ago, was made up of a number of investigators that were interested predominantly in HIV. The circles around those two people you might see in the upper right is Barney Graham, and in the lower left is Peter Kwan. Barney Graham was interested in respiratory syncytial virus, and Peter Kwan was a structural biologist interested in HIV. And they worked in that same building, Building 40 at the NIH. This is one of the early papers looking at the structure-based vaccine design of the envelope. That scriggly thing on the right is the HIV envelope. And you do cryo-electron microscopy to get the right structure of the immunogen. The good news is that it's elegant science. The sad news is that it's been unsuccessful in getting an HIV vaccine yet. And I say yet, because I still am cautiously optimistic that we'll get it. So what happened is that Barney Graham, who was interested in respiratory syncytial virus, used the technology that Peter Kwan taught him to be able to make an immunogen for respiratory syncytial virus. So where am I going with this? What it is, is that the best immunogen would be a stabilized prefusion protein. So when a virus and a cell get together, the virus here is in the prefusion form. When it hits the cell, it fuses and the conformation of the molecule changes. The only trouble is the best immunogen is prefusion, but it's a very wobbly immunogen. It isn't stable. So you're really tough to use it as a vaccine. What they did is use structure-based vaccine design to show that if you make a couple of mutations in the molecule, you stabilize it. And the first thing they did when MERS came along, remember MERS, bat to camel, Middle East respiratory syndrome? We started to make a vaccine against MERS, and we knew exactly what the right mutations were to stabilize the spike protein. This was years ago, few years before COVID. So as soon as the sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 came out, what the investigators at the VRC did was use those same mutations and literally within five days of the sequence being available, they started working on a vaccine. Now, for those of you who follow the history of vaccine, five days is, is unbelievable <laughs> to do it. It usually takes years to do it. They did it in five days. So that's what you have. If these are the vaccines now that the US government has sponsored, in the column that says RNA, that's the platform that I mentioned, 
And on the far right, the S2P is the imagen that Barney Graham has been able to make, and that's used in all of the vaccines now except for one. And his co-worker on that was Kismikia Corbett. And again, they might actually wind up sharing in the Nobel Prize for that. So let me show you the difference in time and the lesson of why it's important to continue to invest in basic and clinical biomedical research. This is the time frame I showed you. Within five days, the vaccine started. Within 65 days of phase one trial, within 139 days of phase two trial, 198 days of phase three trial, and in less than a year, in November of 2020, the clinical trial showed that the vaccine was safe and highly effective. Let's put that into perspective, comparing it to the history of other vaccines. Look at the top. So the years are the time to develop a vaccine from the time that you discovered the microbe. For typhoid, it was only 105 years. For polio, it was 47 years. For HPV, getting better, 22 years. For hepatitis B, 16 years and 11 months for COVID-19. Completely unprecedented in the history of vaccinology. What has been the result? I know there are some, I'm going to be discreet, there are some people who disagree that vaccines work. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I had to do that. Um, so let's take a look at from a one year, practically one year period from December, two year period from December to November of 2022. 3.2 million people have been saved, 18 million hospitalizations have been averted, and 119 million infections, and saving of at least $1 trillion in healthcare costs. This is now been deemed by Science Magazine as the scientific breakthrough of the year. Without a doubt, there wasn't even a close second. And even in the lay literature, Time Magazine put this picture of the four people that I mentioned, Drew Weissman and Katie Carrico for the platform, and, Kizzy, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, Corbett, Kismekia Corbett, and Barney Graham for the immunogen. Okay, let's move on. Lesson number six. Prototype and priority pathogen enable pandemic preparedness. You may have heard that terminology. What does it mean? A priority pathogen approach means you pick out an actual pathogen that you believe in and of itself has pandemic potential, and you start to do research on it, which would require a major investment, before there's even an outbreak. The WHO has done an R&D blueprint, which they picked out a number of diseases, some of them you recognize, like Crimean Congo, hemorrhagic fever, and others, and start working on a vaccine. There's another way to do that that we think is even more creative and will yield better results. And that's called a prototype pathogen approach. What do we mean by that? We mean you take classes and families of pathogens and you build on the prior experience with one of the pathogens within a big family. So there are dozens and dozens and dozens of families of pathogens. There's about seven or eight of them that are high priority of being likely to yield a pathogen of pandemic potential. So we wrote about that a few years ago. I wrote the first paper on that in 2017, but Barney Graham and Kizzy Corbett actually were the ones to promote this prototype pathogen. So what we did is you pick out seven or eight families and you say, I have experience with one or maybe two of the pathogens in there, but the family has the capability of being the birthplace of a pandemic pathogen. So what you do 
is that you apply the strategies and tools from one of these because there are commonalities. Basic virology, animal models, antigenic targets, platforms that are optimal, immune correlates. For example, the experience we had with SARS-CoV-1 and MERS in the bigger family of the coronaviruses allowed us to move extremely quickly on the coronavirus that turned out to be SARS-CoV-2. Lesson number seven. This has to be, and this is the hot topic of today, is the attention to the animal-human interface. Human health is clearly connected to the health of animals. 75 to 80 percent of all of the new pathogens that the human species has experienced jumped from an animal reservoir to a human. HIV, chimp. Influenza, bird, pig. Ebola, bat, non-human primate. Nipah, bat, pig. Go on and on and on. David Morins, my colleague at the NIH and I, about two and a half years ago, wrote a commentary in Cell about, I, I entitled it, How We Got to COVID-19. And it really what it is, is the, um, what you call the encroachment of the human species on the animal kingdom in a way that's really somewhat unnatural, the unbalanced interaction with nature. And one of the easiest way to do that is to bring animals in from the wild that get exposed, for example, to bats that are just a reservoir of infectious viruses, get infected and put them into contact, such as you have with the wet market. And in fact, two extraordinarily important papers were published in August of this past summer by a group of highly qualified evolutionary virologists who did epidemiologic, virologic, and geospatial analysis showing without conclusive, because you still have to keep an open mind of how this virus emerged. Was it a lab leak? Was it a natural occurrence in the market? The data that are accumulating now become more and more compelling that the origin was from the Wuhan wet market because of animals that should not have been there in the first place, but were there in violation of the regulation not to have them there. So how do you reduce the risk? First, you expand surveillance. You stop clearing and degrading tropical and subtropical forests. You hear about that in Brazil and in certain regions in Africa. Improve the health and economic security of the communities that live in hot spots. Enhance biosecurity and animal husbandry, and above all, shut down or strictly regulate wildlife markets and trade. That is probably the most important of the lessons in this category. Lesson eight, something that's sad about our society, longstanding systemic health and social inequities drive pandemic disparities. We know that. We knew it with HIV, and it's very, very clear with COVID. In other words, pandemic uh, emergences put a bright spotlight on the core existing health disparities that are related to the social determinants of health. And we know the longstanding inequities regarding discrimination, limited health care and access, occupations of minority populations that put them out into the community, not being able to sit behind a computer the way many of us do, safe from the exposure on the outside, as well as things like housing, namely multi-generational families in a house when you have a pandemic threat, make it much more likely that there'll be infection within a family. Lesson nine, why do I know about this? Um, <laughs> Misinformation is truly the enemy of pandemic control. And unfortunately, I think we all know, I don't have to tell this audience this, is that we are living 
in an absolute sea of misinformation and disinformation that is propagated very effectively by social media. And I'm not so sure how we're going to get around that, but it can be causing lives. Misinformation and disinformation costs lives. There's no doubt about that. And the misinformation and disinformation that has people not wanting to get vaccinated costs lives. All right, last lesson. For COVID-19, for COVID-19, my favorite philosopher, Yogi Berra, who says, it ain't over till it's over. And what do we mean by it ain't over till it's over? What is the end game of the COVID-19 that we're facing? Well, let's take a look at the possibilities. What could happen? Okay, let's work from the bottom up. Are we going to eradicate SARS-CoV-2? Yeah? What do you think? Eh, no. <laughs> we're not. And the reason we're not, there are a number of reasons. First of all, we've only eradicated one virus in the history of human health. And that virus, listen, this is important, has a number of characteristics. It's phenotypically stable. The smallpox that infected the Egyptian pharaohs is the same smallpox that we eliminated in 1980, number one. Number two, there was a widely acceptable vaccination campaign. And number three, the immunity induced by infection or vaccine lasts a minimum of decades and more likely for a lifetime. All right. Are we going to eliminate SARS-CoV-2? Sorry? No. Why? Again, we've eliminated things like polio and measles from the United States, even though, as we know, there's measles and polio in other regions of the world. But why were we able to eliminate it in the United States? Number one. Measles is a stable virus. I'm old enough that I got infected with measles when I was a kid. That measles is the same measles that's infecting people in Pakistan and Afghanistan right now. It hasn't changed. Number two, the protection from infection or vaccination lasts decades, if not a lifetime. Now, let's take a look at SARS. Cov2. Unfortunately, as I mentioned on a prior slide, the evolution of genotypically and phenotypically diverse variants, it just keeps changing so that you don't have a stable virus. Importantly, something we all know, that the vaccine-induced and infection-induced immunity is measured in months, not in decades or a lifetime. So without getting too depressed about that, there is a solution. And that is the next thing is control. So what do you mean by control? That means if you get enough people vaccinated, and many people have gotten infected, so vaccinated and infected, which is hybrid immunity, that you will be able to get the ultimate level of protection in the community low enough that it won't disrupt the social order the way it has for the last three years. Some people refer to that as return to normalcy. Some people call it endemicity. Some people say it's similar to other viruses that we have that we live with and we learn to deal with, even though we wish they weren't there. We can very likely do that by over a period of time intermittently boosting with whatever the strain that happens to be the predominant strain. And that's why you hear the FDA and the CDC talk about perhaps getting a cadence of maybe once a year to get boosted, similar to what we do with influenza. That very likely will be the way where I think, I'm a cautious optimist, that we're on our way there and we'll likely get there in the not too distant future. What about beyond COVID? So let's close up with that. I wrote this article in the New England Journal a few, three months ago, and you know, playing on my, my old friend 
Yogi Berra, I said, it ain't over till it's over, but it's never over. And emerging and re-emerging infections are really here to stay. Let's just take a look. If you look at the outbreaks in the United States and multiple other countries, literally every month or so you have the emergence of an infection. Our task and our lesson that we need to learn is that if we do and pay attention to some of the things that I've spoken about, that you can prevent an emerging infection from becoming a pandemic. It is very unlikely that you will prevent totally the emergence of a new infection, but you can prevent or blunt that emergence from becoming a pandemic. And on this last slide, as I wrote now, it's been 15 years ago, that emerging infections are a perpetual challenge. And the only way you address a perpetual challenge is by perpetual preparedness. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for that wonderful lecture. We have the privilege of having you close by and have, having invited you to Georgetown many times. But in the past, you were guarded a bit for, um, because you work for the government. Are you able to kind of talk a little bit more beyond those limitations today? We are all wondering. Uh, I don't think I was very guarded when I worked for the government. <laughs> Got in a little trouble for that, but no, I mean, uh, what would you like me to be unguarded about? <laughs> be specific. Well, my good friend and colleague, Rebecca Katz, and I were talking a little bit about, you know, what to ask. And in 2017, you gave a lecture reflecting on your um, navigating, um, you know, six, seven presidents. It was six at the time. It, it was five. And then we, we were just starting to get Trump. Right? <laughs> I wanted to open up a space no. to talk about how you may even reflect on yeah. those notes a bit. Well, for no. the, with so many, it's great to see so many young faces in the audience, which means to me that you probably weren't at that lecture several years ago. But in the very beginning, the first months of the Trump administration, I, my lecture was, and I got to pull it out because it really will blow you away, because I, 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 I spoke about every president that I had the privilege of advising, starting off with Ronald Reagan. And it was uncanny that for each of them that there was a challenge of a, an outbreak of some sort that, from the standpoint of my relationship with them, dominated the interaction. With Ronald Reagan was HIV. It spilled over into George H.W. Bush. You know, with Clinton, we had a bunch of outbreaks. And then we had Ebola and we had Zika. And the last slide was a picture of Donald Trump, and it was a question mark saying, I don't know what his infectious disease challenge is going to be, but I'll guarantee you that there will be one. Never in my wildest dreams that I think it was going to be as bad as this. But if I know, Rebecca, you remember that last slide. I ended the talk with a, with a picture, and it said, question mark, what will be the infectious disease challenge? And then three years later, came COVID, right? You know, as an anthropologist, I have to ask about your social life of those early days of the pandemic or your political life. You've always been an incredible, important beacon and leader for the global health community. Um, how did you navigate the, the politics, of the everyday politics between science, mm -hmm. politics, realism, and imagined possibilities? Well, part of your question which says my social, I have no social life. I don't do it. <laughs> I'm a nerd. I don't. <laughs> um, um, actually, um, you have to maintain some fundamental principles, and that is stick with the science and, and, and never veer from that, even when the science turns out to be an inconvenient truth for somebody. Uh, and you'd be surprised that when people um, uh, concerned about 
uh, being pressured into doing something or saying something, which some people in science do, unfortunately. I learned a lesson from a very good friend of mine, a, a person much older than I. Can you imagine somebody actually being much <laughs> older than I? Uh, is, um, told me the first time I went into the White House to see Ronald Reagan, he, he told me something that I would have hoped and maybe that I would have come to that conclusion anyway, but it was great advice. And he said, when you walk into the White House going under the awning of the West Wing lower level to see the president, you should tell yourself, this may be the last time I'm going into this building because you may have to tell the president or somebody of a higher level something that they may not want to hear and then they may, in essence, metaphorically shoot the messenger and not ask you to come back. So if you're so worried about being asked back, you probably are not going to be very efficient because you're going to be saying things that are really not true. So the way I was able to navigate in answer to your question was just tell the truth based on facts and data as you know it and just you will see that people will wind up respecting you even when you tell them things that are not particularly convenient to what they're doing. And, and many of the presidents, I had to tell them things. For example, when I had to talk to George H.W. Bush and say we weren't doing enough with HIV, which you know was not a pleasant thing to hear, but he accepted that and he started to really increase the resources for it. He could have told me, get out of here, don't bother me, but he didn't. He said, you know, that's interesting that you say that. Let's turn that around and do more. And it was the same thing with several of the other presidents, with one exception. What? <laughs> well, that brings us to actually a really important thing to highlight is your extraordinary influence and and central role in responding and then leading through the AIDS epidemic. And we were wondering, and some of my students and I were talking about this earlier, um, what were some of the most important lessons learned from those early days that you have carried with you throughout your whole career um, that also helped you respond to this most recent crisis? Well, there are fundamental things that, that <coughs> pandemics occur. <laughs> and, and you know, remember, HIV, opened our eyes to the fact that new diseases can occur. I mean, all of the training of my mentors, they went through their entire training never being faced with a brand new disease. And then when we were faced with HIV, the lesson is that new diseases do occur. And we've had multiple examples of that since then, but HIV was the first really forceful, cogent example that new diseases occurred. The other uh, less, there were so many lessons, the importance of what, how stigma is the enemy of public health. I mean, the idea that we did not early on as a nation uh, understand how important this was going to be because it was infecting a disenfranchised group. Our own politicians didn't pay enough attention to it early on. The other lesson learned is you got to pay attention to the community and I think our work with the activists from the very beginning, who were really quite correct in their concern and their pushing back on the rigidity of the scientific enterprise and particularly the rigidity of the regulatory uh, component of our society, they were totally right. They, you know, people contrast and compare the, you know, kill Fauci, take his head off back in the days of 1980s when the AIDS activists were doing that with the you know, Steve Bannon behead Fauci because he's arguing against what we're trying to do. Those were completely different concepts. It was like apples and, and watermelons different because the AIDS activists were actually asking us to look at what the reality was and they were being confrontative in order to gain our attention to get us to understand why what we were doing was ill-suited to the unique nature of this brand new virus that was killing a lot of young, otherwise healthy gay men. It started off with gay men and then it became clear it was really a global situation. The pushback now is really based on disinformation, misinformation and conspiracy theories. So even though what appears to be the same sort of pushing back 
the motivations and, and, and the stimulus for them are completely different, completely different. Now, I could hug you all day. This is such a privilege. But I think we have some incredibly bright young people here today with some questions. So I see a question in the middle right there, just to make it really complicated for the microphone. Can you stand up? Can we? Thank you so much, Dr. Fauci. Uh, my name is Ulysses. I'm a sophomore in the SFS. And yeah, thank you so much. Um, my question revolves around the HIV AIDS pandemic. You were the face of information in the early days of the HIV AIDS pandemic. How do you manage to continue to communicate with the public now in the age of disinformation, and particularly with the AIDS pandemic, given that it was so controversial, arguably more so than COVID? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The, the, it relates a little bit to the, the, my answer a little bit ago, but your question is an excellent question. When, when you are dealing with a sea of misinformation and disinformation, and there is the normalization of untruths, and by the normalization of untruths, I mean there is so much lying egregious lying going on that the public tends to get you know, almost dulled to it and just accept it as part of life. The only trouble with that is that when there's no real truth and no compass of what's true and what's not true, then anybody can say anything and you could argue that that's reality when it isn't. So trying to communicate with public health principles when you have so many people who are not only saying things that are misinformation, but you have a substantial proportion of the population that actually believes that. And that's the thing that worries me right now about society that we have come to accept the normalization of untruths, where you can say something that is completely egregiously wrong, you get proven in a fact check that you're wrong, and the answer is it doesn't matter. I still believe that this is the case. If that's the way we're gonna be continuing to function, I think society is really in a bad place, really in a bad place. Let's take a question up here, yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Fauci, for your time and decades of service. Um, stand up part. Um, my name is Aditi Singh. I'm a master's student in the Foreign Service School. Um, my question regards a lot of conversation around um, immune correlates for next generation vaccines and some of the scientific gaps we're discovering um, as we try to you know, move that progression of that platform. So I'm wondering how you communicate to the public um, you know, when the best answer sometimes is, I don't know, and how you navigate that field of, you know, maintaining trust in the public, um, but also not handing out information that you're not completely sure that we have the science to back up. Thank you. Yeah. Again, a very good question that is very, very difficult, not difficult to answer, but difficult to deal with. The answer being is that you should never guess <laughs> when you're dealing with public health. If you don't know, you should not be afraid of saying, we don't know. But often, what happens is that particularly the media are, are hungry to come out with a message. And I don't know is not a good message. They need to hear some little tidbit of what you think it might be. And then what happens is that if you start going down that road of a little tidbit of what you think it might be, and it turns out not to be the case, then as you're alluding to, then you lose credibility and you lose the trust of the public. And I think what we're hearing now, you probably are aware of it, is that the trust in science now is at a low level than it's been in a very long time. And I believe that that is because of a lack of understanding uh, and, I mean, we could always do a better job of articulating that, but a lack of understanding that when you're dealing with 
the scientific approach to a biological public health problem, and you're dealing with an evolving situation where what you know in January is just different than what you know in July because things evolve. You learn more about transmissibility. All of the lessons I showed, we didn't know that it was highly transmissible. We didn't know that it was aerosol transmitted. We didn't know that mostly transmitted by asymptomatic people. So when you would say certain things that it would be based on what you know now. And then when you get new data, you change it and people say, well, wait a minute, you're flip-flopping. Because what they're doing, they're equating the science associated with a biological and a public health problem with the science associated with math. So let me give you a really simple analogy or metaphor or whatever. In January of 2020, two plus two equals four. In March of 2023, two plus two still equals four. In January of 2020, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and our understanding of it is dramatically different than what it is today. So what changed? What changed was the evolution of understanding and the virus itself changing. Did we ever think, I showed that on the slide, I think that was lesson number 1.2, was that the variants, we never would have imagined that we would have had a, an ancestral strain variant, and then two years later, we'd have Omicron, which is completely different, and eluded all of the protection that you should have gotten from vaccine or from prior infection. So the answer to your question is, it's a real problem when you're trying to maintain credibility and giving people the truth at any given time because the truth based on data will change as the data changes. We would like to keep you here all day, but we have time for one more question. Who? Oh, I'm getting uh, nervous. Someone in the back. Hi, Dr. Fauci. Uh, I'm Ralph. I went to Regis High School also. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming in here today. I uh, really appreciate it. My question is about specifically the policy choices that were made related to lockdowns and other um, measures like that. Many of us in this room um, were not at Georgetown for over a year and a half on campus, and I was just wondering what you thought about policies like that and other school closures um, and measures like that in retrospect, knowing what we do now. Yeah, well, locking down without a purpose, um, without an end game, you get the negative aspects. Whenever you lock down, you lock down because you want to save lives. Um, when you get to a point when you're locking down and you haven't either utilized the period to, to, to get the advantage of that, um, then lockdowns are ill-advised. Um, Lockdown should be sparingly used and only used in, in emergent situations. So, and again, when you talk about lockdown, you gotta be really careful what you mean by lockdown because there are varying levels of lockdown. When, when we in the, in the White House, when Debbie Burks and I proposed the 15-day shutdown followed by a 30-day shutdown, you may not remember, but that was when the meat packing freezer trucks were parked in front of Elmer's hospital because they had to put the bodies in there because the morgues were overflowing. The same thing was seen in Boston in front of Mass General and the Brigham. So when you have a tsunami of cases where you have to shut it off immediately, you can't say, let's wait X number of months until we get a vaccine or let's wait X number of months until we do this. When you're running out of hospital beds and you're running out of ventilators, you gotta do something draconian because otherwise there would have been a lot more lives lost. However, you've gotta balance that and continually testing whether it's still worth locking down. The initial lockdown reason was a life-saving reason. How long you close a school, how long you do you know, you diminish activities on the outside, 
has to be a dynamic process, which you've got to evaluate in real time. Now is the risk benefit still in favor of restriction, or is the risk benefit leaning much more towards loosening up? And that's what's going to be interesting, because we're going to go back and examine that. Is, were things done too long or not? But the initial decision to lock things down unequivocally saved a lot of lives. No doubt about that. Not even close. Before we end, I have to ask, with many students at this wonderful Jesuit institution are thinking about a life in public service, do you have some parting words of advice and guidance um, as they think about following in your footsteps, potentially, or learning from your incredible career in some way? Well, you know, public service is not for everyone. Um, no, it isn't. I mean, you, you can't say everybody should be a public servant, but somehow fashioning in your life service to others can be part of everybody's uh, goal in life. And, and you mentioned the Jesuit institution. You might know that one of the mottos of a Jesuit institution is service for others. That doesn't mean you have to go into the government to serve. But you can, do, sir, you can do a lot of things outside of government. So I would encourage everybody in the room <laughs> to actually think of some way that what you do, whatever you go into, that you do something where you give back and serve the public. For those of you who want to make public service the official aspiration of your career, I can tell you my own experience uh, is just its enormously gratifying and the, the feeling you get about doing what you're doing for the benefit not only of yourself, for others, is just one of the most incredible feelings you can get in the world. But you don't, not everybody has to do that. And that's the reason why I started off by saying, you shouldn't say, well, if I'm not in public service, then I'm not really living up to what I should be doing is you can be a public servant by being a police officer. You know, you could be a public servant by being a physician or a nurse or a politician. E. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for serving as our Lori Lester. Thank you.